All right, guys, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the CU Hacking Club. If you're new here, welcome. Uh, we meet more or less every other week throughout the semester, so we won't meet next week. We'll probably meet the week after that. It tends to be 7.30 on Thursdays in here. With a few exceptions, we have a mailing list. That's where we send all of our information to. If you're not on it, you should catch up with me after we're done here. I can tell you how to get on it. It's from the dark ages and is one of the built-in school mailing lists, so you have to actually send it mail to subscribe to it. I know, my novel. Uh, but if you want to do that, we can tell you where to send your mail after this, and that way you can make sure you're getting all the updates. Maybe you're already here because you're already getting all the updates, and this is a moot point. That's fine, too. So I'm Andy Saylor. I'm a first-year PhD student here in the department. I work in the Systems and Networks lab. Some of you may have seen my presentation last semester on wireless network sniffing and security. So what we're going to be talking about tonight is kind of just a broad overview of what it takes on at least a Linux server to kind of go from nothing to a semi-secure server that has some of the basic uh, services up and running. So. This is a lot of what you would cover if you find yourself in a position where you need to set up a new server for someone. This is kind of, uh, for some of you, if you've done this before, will probably be a complete review, but for the rest of you, this is kind of the what you need to know not to make a complete fool of yourself while you're trying to do this. So I sent out an email earlier. I'll send out all these slides and everything when we're done. A lot of this follows, well, my demos will be following Ubuntu 11.10. Uh, this is all fairly applicable across the board for pretty much any Linux environment, and to a lesser extent, some of it's applicable in kind of any Nix environment, period. To an even lesser extent, some of it applies to Windows, but that's not so much the focus tonight. It's more on Nix, Linux in, in particular, and Ubuntu slash Debian would be what's closest to what we're actually going to be talking about tonight. But these principles do expand. They go beyond that. Some of this is done because we do have a hacking team that is competing in a competition coming up here in about a month. So this is stuff that they need to know, but it'll benefit the rest of you too. Feel free to interrupt me anytime during the presentation. We can stop and tangent as much as we need. I don't actually know how long these slides are going to take because I only found out I was doing this presentation four days ago, so I haven't run it yet. If you didn't notice, I am recording this. You've been forewarned. If you have a problem with that, I'll turn the camera off when we're done. You can ask me your questions then. But Assume that any questions you ask during the course of the presentation, at least the audio, which is going to be recorded as well as my response, it'll probably end up on YouTube later. Uh, we'll see. So, any questions before we dive in on logistics, what you're doing here, why you're sitting in this room? All right. Well, we'll get started. So, like I mentioned, the, the uh, kind of... Uh, concept we're dealing with here is if you need to go and set up a new Linux server for some reason, be this on a cloud environment where you're setting it up on a VM or whether you're setting up the actual physical server, a lot of this will focus a little bit more on the you have access to the physical hardware type environment because of the same kind of considerations that come in there. Everything we'll be doing tonight is tested on Ubuntu 11.10. It all pretty much works since Ubuntu 11. Point, or since Ubuntu 10.04. And like I said, in the broader sense, a lot of this stuff is applicable in other places too, but that's where it's guaranteed to work. I'm gonna switch back and forth some between the slide presentation and a server I'm operating right now that runs this operating system on which I've already done a lot of this to kind of demo a few of the commands. Um, again, interrupt me while we're at it. I apologize, it'll be me doing most of the work. It's not quite as interactive maybe as the last one, but that's what we get. So where do you start when you're doing this? And this does kind of come back to the fact that security really is a full life cycle concept, right? You can't start in the middle of the game and say, well, okay, now we're going to start doing security. It doesn't work. If you really want to be secure, you got to think about it from the ground up. And that means if you're going to install, set up a new server, you're going to have to install an operating system. Before you can even install the operating system, you're going to have to get your installation media. Now, in the wonderful world of Linux, we don't have to pay anything for our access to these operating systems, and we often download them online either from a website or via something like BitTorrent if you don't want to wait three hours for it to download from the Ubuntu website. This is great, but it does mean that your sources aren't exactly verifiable. Someone could have hacked the website you're using, someone could have spoofed it. The easiest way into your system is to break the ISO you're installing and install some backdoor in it before you even install it, right? If you're going and installing pre-hacked Linux 101, you're not really going to be able to secure it. So. They always publish things called checksums. Checksum is basically a numerical value. There's different ways of doing it. MD5 hash is probably the most common. But this is something that the publisher of the software will publish. So if it's Ubuntu, Canical, who makes Ubuntu, will come out and say, OK, for the 11.04 ISO, we know that it has this checksum. It's going to be this long string of digits and numerals uh, and characters. 
that doesn't really mean anything to you, but it's a way of verifying the product. So when you get your copy of the ISO, whether you downloaded it or ported it over BitTorrent, you always, before you even put it on a CD, run the MD5 sum command on it. That'll spit out another list of alphanumeric characters. If that doesn't match what Canical says it should be, you don't have a good copy of it. Either someone's purposely modified it or something's just gone wrong in the downloading. So you would never go past this point without verifying at least to some degree of accuracy that the media you're installing is actually what you think you're installing. And that basically starts here. Next up would be you have to actually burn that to a CD or DVD. Same idea, right? If you are running, working for Microsoft and your job's to install every one of their computers, there's a lot of incentive for someone to break into your machine and install something that modifies every CD you burn to insert some kind of a back door, right? If you're an average home user, this is probably less of an issue. Your home machine's probably trusted or no one's targeting you. But in big commercial environments, you have to make sure that the machine you're using to set up this CD is trusted in and of itself. Make sure that that's a secure machine, that you're the only one that has access to it, and that you have a pretty good idea of what's going on there. Or checking into this phase isn't going to do you any good because someone could corrupt it right here. Last thing is all of these things have pretty much a built-in self-check before you even do the installer. When you stick in the Ubuntu CD and you boot to the installer screen, there's always an option to run a CD self-check. This is just something you should do, period. In reality, this isn't a huge security thing because if someone's smart enough to corrupt your ISO, they can also probably corrupt this self-check to make it say that it's okay. But at the very least, this tells you your CD burn worked correctly and will save you an hour's worth of work and if you get halfway through it and realize the CD is corrupt. So, it really is a ground up concept. You can't expect anything past the installation point to be secure if you don't start with it. These are the kind of, I mean, this is where people go wrong, right? Nobody thinks about this. So it's a common attack vector, even more so than some of the other stuff we'll be talking about later. You really have to be careful that you actually know what you're installing before we get started. So assuming you get past that, you run the Ubuntu installation CD, so on and so forth, you boot into your box for the first time, you have this nice running bare bones server that's partially configured kind of in the default manner. Some of it's secure, some of it's not. So where do we start? There's a lot of places you could start, um, but one argument says that in real life you very rarely find yourself actually typing on a keyboard on a server. These servers are going to get installed and then they're going to hang out in a server room somewhere where there aren't any people. So the first thing you need to do is make sure you can access the server remotely because that's what's going to allow you to do everything from that point forward. Again, if you're doing this on a home machine and not a server, yeah, you probably have access to it. This is maybe not where you would start. But in a server environment, you pretty much aren't going to have direct physical, or at least you're not going to have convenient physical access to it. So you need to give yourself some way to access it otherwise. And the way we do that is via SSH, which I'm sure you've all used, definitely from the client side. Uh, what we're going to talk about now is kind of setting it up from the server side. So SSH stands for the Secure Shell Handler. It's a fully encrypted mechanism, essentially, to give you remote terminal access on a computer. The security of SSH is pretty good. As long as you set it up correctly, it tends to be a fairly safe protocol, at least in terms of knowing that uh, your communication isn't being intercepted and decoded, or that it's in fact you are in fact communicating with the computer that you think you're communicating with. So, as we mentioned before, SSH has two sides. On almost every machine in the world, except maybe Windows ones, there's some kind of an SSH client installed. We're not going to be talking about that. That's what you would actually use when you type an SSH on the command line and make a connection using an SSH client. We're going to be talking about setting up the server side of SSH, which is what actually enables you to connect to that machine from an SSH client. So, in Linux, the SSH server is referred to as SSHD. The D is for daemon. This is a pretty common naming convention within the Linux world. Anytime you have a something D, it tends to mean it's a background process that runs. It generally implements some kind of a service. So, in this case, it's SSHD. If you want to read all about the config, you can look up this man page here. Like many things in Linux, the configuration is done by editing a configuration file somewhere. And the standard place to put configuration files in a Linux environment is in the slash etc folder. So pretty much everything in slash etc is some kind of a configuration file of one form or another. If you need to go looking for where your config files are for a program, they're probably in slash etc slash name of the program. SSH is no exception. If you want to configure SSH, you start out in the slash etc slash SSH and then the name of the text file that you would use to configure the server is this sshd config file. There's a number of common changes you would want to do. Uh, by default, when you've set up a Ubuntu server, SSH isn't even enabled by default. So the first thing you need to do is either enable it and or install it. Uh, I don't know if it's installed as part of the common image. It normally is if you install the Ubuntu server CD image. 
If it wasn't installed, it's not on the slide here, but Ubuntu uses the apt-get management system, so you would run sudo apt-get sshd, so on and so forth. Um, but once it's installed, it's, it's generally is installed, but it's not configured to allow any connections, which is good. We would rather start out with having it not allow anything than start out with it having allow everything, because at least then it stays secure for the amount of time until you actually make it insecure by opening up a, a portal for you to get into it. So the first thing we'll look at, and I'll bounce over into the configuration file on my server here in a sec, is the concept of which users you want to use SSH. On most servers, you have more than one user. And at the end of the day, not all of them may need SSH access. Um, you can configure this from either direction. You can either whitelist users, meaning you're using the allow users command, so you're specifically naming which users have access to that server. Or you can blacklist users using the deny users, where you would allow everyone except those listed path to the deny users directory. Normally, whitelisting is a better idea than blacklisting because this guarantees that you know exactly what you're doing. This could always open up a door where maybe you forgot that some user existed that you don't really want to give access to, but because it's only denied users, by default, they're going to have access. So we'll look at that. The next thing is you deal with SSH is how you actually authenticate. Most SSH protocols, by default, are configured to take a password. It's the same password you would use when you actually got on the machine. Now, that's fine and dandy, assuming your password is strong. And as it turns out, for most users, their passwords aren't actually all that strong. So one school of thought says you should never allow password authentication over SSH, simply because, especially on a public server, someone's password is going to be password. And then how hard is it for someone to gain access to your server? So as an alternative to using passwords, you can use what we call public SSH keys, where essentially every user gets assigned a public key. It's part of a public-private key pair, where the other half of the key is then stored on the server. And instead of typing in the password, the user basically provides this key. Now, in an environment like CU, we don't do this merely because it would just be too much work to maintain, right? You have to keep track of these certificates for everyone. You have to assign them. Everyone has to be able to manage them. It's a lot more complicated than just typing in a password. But there is a school of thought that says passwords are never going to be secure enough. You should solely use SSH keys. You can also allow it to use either, uh, which there's sometimes an argument for. On my servers, I still allow password authentication, but that's also because I'm the only user on most of my servers, and I can make sure my password is secure. Um, again, in a large organization, if you're working for a large company, often they'll assign keys instead of passwords because there's enough people that you can't trust everyone to have a secure password, but you're also paying people a lot of money to manage your network for you so they can deal with making sure everyone has a valid key. There's also the concept of PAM, which we'll touch, touch on a little bit later. PAM is a Linux security subsystem, kind of, that stands for Pluggable Authentication Module where essentially what PAM specifies is it's an interface for providing alternatives to authentication. So if you don't want passwords, you don't want the built-in key system, you can use PAM modules instead, where there's tons of PAM modules out there. If anyone uses two-factor authentication on their Google accounts, where it either texts you or you have to use your phone to type in a code every time you log in, Google releases a PAM module that lets you do that with your server. So every time you SSH into your server, Google will text a code to your phone. You then have to type that in. To get that up and running, you use these PAM modules. It's basically an extension system that allows you to use kind of other forms of authentication that aren't built into the Linux system. You could do an entire lecture on this. We're not going to touch on it too much. But know it exists. Know it's kind of like a plug-in system for authentication. And it's not specific to SSH. You can use this for your actual logging in on the computer, too. Um, if you want it to text you every time you log into your computer, you can have a PAM module handle that, too. There's a lot of other things here. If people use RSA keys, ever worked for a company that assigns RSA keys, which is a little device that has a rotating cipher on it, kind of the same concept. You have to type that in. It, it provides an additional form of authentication that even if someone breaks your password, unless they also have your cell phone or your RSA key, it's not going to do them any good. Have I lost anyone thus far? If I'm talking too much or too fast, too, feel free to stop me. The other kind of common configuration options we'll look at here in a sec is the concept of forwarding. One way to use SSH is just to SSH into a machine, get your terminal prompt into your work there. But often you'll want to SSH through a machine. Either you want your internet connection to go through that machine because, say, I'm at home and I want access to the libraries here on campus that are, that are firewalled if you're outside of campus. I can SSH forward my internet connection through a campus computer, which then to the world makes it look like I'm coming from campus. There's various reasons you might want to do that. It's called TCP SSH forwarding. So you may want that enabled, you may not. X11 forwarding is the same concept, only it forwards the graphics interface. So if you have a graphical program like MATLAB, you have a lab that has MATLAB installed on it, 
this is how I never paid for MATLAB as an undergrad, right? There are there are computers at the school that run Linux and run MATLAB. If I need to use MATLAB, I just SSH into them with X11 port forwarding. I call the MATLAB command, and it pops up a MATLAB window on my home machine, just like I were working in person on the other machine. Even though normally you only have a graphical interface, this is a way of forwarding the X uh, graphics interface, graphics-based interface, and window interface that comes with Linux. There's also the log level concept. This You're going to see this in a lot of places. Pretty much everything on Linux has the ability to log. From a security standpoint, increasing the verbosity of your logs or increasing what gets logged tends to be a good idea, especially if you find yourself spending a lot of time looking into incidents that may have occurred. Obviously, the more information you have, the better. But at the same time, if you're Google, you're getting attacked 10,000 times every minute, right? So at the end of the day, do you really need to log all of that? No. You're not going to go back and see all these people that are constantly bombarding you. Even my little server at home that we're going to be looking at tonight, people without any access to it try to SSH into it 10 or 20 times a day. And like, it has nothing on it. I am nobody. It's just people out there are looking for this kind of stuff. There is an argument to say verbosity is good, but at the same time, too much verbosity is just going to mean you have logs that become unreadable. So it's a personal decision, but it's something you should look at. The last note, which actually kind of ties back into this allow users thing, is standard school of thought says that you should never, ever give root SSH access on a machine. There's really no reason to, and it's only a security flaw. Um, if you really need to do something that requires root access while you're SSH'd in, that's what the sudo command was invented for. Um, giving root access directly is just opening up a door. I mean, it's, it's opening up a really big target for someone to try to crack your root password and have the ability to do that. Um, so on and so forth. So in general, there's really very few situations where you would want to give root SSH access to a machine. Um, you can get the same functionality out of sudo. Ubuntu actually takes the root thing a step further. In Ubuntu, you can't even log in as root. There is a root account, but it's completely disabled as far as logging in is concerned. To do anything, you use the sudo command. Um, you never actually are logged in as the root user. And Again, there's kind of security mentality behind doing that. As long as you have the sudo command, that's a slightly more secure way of using root as opposed to using root directly because it's logged and it's controlled. And you can cut someone off from that access if it turns out they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. Whereas if you give someone your root password, you're screwed if they own your machine. People okay on this? All right, so let's take a break from slide land for a moment. And actually look at this. Is this readable? People, do I need to make the font bigger? All right, so we're sitting on my machine right now. Uh, that's over on the other side of Boulder, and we'll go ahead and look at how I have SSH set up. This is also a good test that everything's actually secure because I should be able to show you guys all of it, and you still shouldn't be able to break in if I've done it right. Um, so let's go ahead and look at that file that we were, uh, that configuration file. It's backslash, etc., backslash SSH. And then it is the, except it's probably backslash, um, sshd config. So as we see here, there's actually two config files. This is for configuring your client. This is for configuring your server. And we're looking at the server here, so we want the one that has the D after it. So I will go ahead and launch that. And now we're looking at the config file. So I'm not going to go through all of this. You can look at the man page for there's tons more directives than what I even talked about. But as we can kind of see here, uh, the first thing that comes up is just this allow users command, right? This is kind of a standard config file format on Linux. Your comments are set up by hashes. That just means it ignores that line. And then all the other lines are kind of keyword value pairs, where you have some keyword followed by one or more values that then this file gets parsed every time you restart the server or start your machine and that's how it actually gets configured. So right now, the only user that's allowed to use SSH on this machine is me, as it should be. There's no one else who needs access to this server. We can control what port SSH uses. 22 is the default port. Using the default port's good and bad, right? It's the default port, so people, when they just type in SSH, that's where it's gonna go to. At the same time, when people are attacking me, they're gonna attack me on port 22. I mean, everyone already knows that that's the SSH port. So it's, uh, again, it's a vector of attack. I've done some other things to make brute force attacks less of a problem, so I leave mine at port 22 because I prefer just to be able to use the default. If you change this to something whenever someone else is interested in your machine, they have to provide an additional argument that specifies the port. Um, 
Just as a random fact, the next most commonly used port to port 22 is port 2234 because of all the system admins that think they're really clever and by adding a number sequence of three and four after it, they don't think anyone will guess it. Anyway, if port 22 doesn't work and you're trying to access a machine that you don't know where the SSH is, uh, try 2234 next because all the system admins that are trying to be smart tend to put it at that. <sighs> And then um, the next things we kind of see are, there are these listen addresses here. This is essentially, if you have a computer that has more than one network card, you can control which network cards you allow SSH on. Mine just allows on everything. That's why these are commented out, essentially. There's some information here about the host key side. We won't really get into that. Uh, it doesn't come into play quite as much. Let's go down. So here's that log level command we saw. Mine's just set at info. That's the default. Again, we could up into verbose. You can move it down. The man page talks about all of this. And then, what else do we have in here? Um, I have public key authentication enabled. So in addition to using a password, I could also just provide my public key. Now, like I said, password login is also enabled, but I specifically disallow any kind of root logins, which is what that command does, uh, which is generally what you want to do. I don't know how much of the rest of this is all that interesting. So I don't use the deny hosts command at all because I'm whitelisting, right? So I'm only using allow hosts. You can use both, but it kind of creates an awkward middle ground when you have contradictions. So you tend to just use one or the other. If we go down a little bit further, so some of this stuff's in here to kind of minimize denial of service attacks. This says it's immediately going to reject anything that anyone that doesn't provide a password. So this is making it harder for someone to just try to slam my machine with a bunch of requests that don't have any password in an effort to take it offline via network traffic, right? Um, so denying passwords, I have that turned off. This is where you would get into adding various PAM modules if you wanted to. Um, this is where you would disable password authentication if you wanted to. Like I said, I have my passwords enabled. And then it gets down to some other stuff here that we're not going to deal with. Here are the forwarding options. I have both TCP and X11 forwarding turned on, um, mainly because when I'm in places like other countries and I want to watch Hulu, I can TCP forward back through my server in the US. Things like Hulu and Netflix are locked out to only allow US IP addresses, but by allowing my, but since I have a server I can forward through, I can essentially get a US IP address anywhere in the world. So, Just as a side note. Um, I mean, we're reading text files here, which is only so exciting, but that's what the file looks like. There's a man page that describes everything you can do in it. Uh, questions on that? Okay. So, let's move on. So we mentioned brute force attacks, which once you enable SSH, the first thing you're pretty much asking for is people will try to brute force it. Like I said, my who should even care about it because it has a few music files on it and nothing sensitive. Uh, server gets attacked 10 or 20 times a day via brute force attack. Uh, so you can imagine if you're actually a large company or a domain name someone's heard of before, you're gonna get attacked way more than that. So that's the issue then is how do you manage mitigating these brute force attacks? Well, if you're using X11, or not X11, if you're using SSH keys, you're not allowing passwords, there's some arguments say that they can brute force attack all day, they're never actually gonna get through, so who cares? But at the same time, there's an argument say that you should try to lock out brute force attacks, period, because there's no reason someone performing a brute force attack should be allowed to continue to do so if you have the ability to prevent it. Um, they could try to mount at least a denial of service attack, if nothing else, where they just try to bring you online by sheer volume, and bring you offline by sheer volume of traffic, or if you are allowing passwords, eventually they're probably gonna get through. It only takes, I mean, password cracking is a matter of time and computing power. Uh, it's not a, it's, it's a solved problem. We know how to do it. It's just a matter of how much time it takes you to do it. So Ubuntu and uh, other Linux have this, there's, there's various varieties of this program, but I'll talk about one, uh, is this deny host program, where deny hosts, what it basically does is it monitors all the incoming connections to your computer and automatically starts blacklisting IP addresses when they meet certain behaviors. So again, you can figure this through a configuration file. There's all of this nice man page about it if you want to read into the details. But the way I use it is I can basically say, okay, anytime someone has five failed login attempts to my SSH server, I'm going to log their IP address and blacklist it so that I'm just automatically going to throw away any traffic coming from that computer. So if I screw up my password five times, 
I'm a little bit screwed, right? I can't log in from that machine anymore until I go home and manually reset it with physical access. But in reality, that never happens to me. Um, this would be a, more of an issue. So on the CU network, this is done, but you have to be, you can't just say if you fail your login five times, we're gonna lock you out forever, right? Because every student would get locked out on a Friday night when they came home and tried to log into their machine. <laughs> So the other commands you can kind of figure this, you have reset periods. You can say that every day I'm going to reset all of this, right? So essentially that means it's not five and I'm logged out, locked out forever. It means I fail five times and I'm locked out for a day. Or I'm locked out for an hour, so on and so forth. This also has the capabilities to sync with the common server. If you're operating a large organization that has a lot of machines, you can have them all kind of sync to the same block database. So if someone tries to brute force one of your machines, they get locked out of all of your machines. So essentially by implementing this, I ensure that nobody in the real world gets more than 10 chances to guess my passwords, which they're not going to be able to do. So enabling this, like, this, is, this is how I justify still having passwords enabled over SSH, is the fact that if anyone's going to break my passwords, they have to do it in 10 tries or less, which is pretty unlikely. So if you are going to set up SSH, setting up something, and especially if you're going to allow passwords, setting up something like deny hosts in line with it tends to be a good idea. Um, I'm not going to look at the, we could look at this config file too, but uh, you've seen one config file, you've kind of seen them all. Like I said, it's these options that are pretty much in there. It's a good idea to set up if you're using SSH, and I highly recommend it. It also emails me. This is how I know I get attacked 10 times a day, right? It emails me every time I blacklist someone. So I get 10 or so of these blacklist emails a day saying, IP address so-and-so, which resolves to host name so-and-so, tried to brute force your server today, and they're not allowed to use it anymore. How did they find it? So, I mean, it has a public IP address. I have a public static IP address. So, it's, I, I use Comcast Business Class, right? So, anyone could scan the Comcast Business. They know what IP address space that is, right? You can scan the entire IP address space just firing off pings until you get something back. Uh, it's set up to respond to pings because I use it when I'm troubleshooting. So, it's not like it tries to hide. Uh, and there are people out there that, I mean, a lot of hacking is opportunity is opportunistic. It's just a matter of, there's people out there scanning the entire internet. They're going to get a list back of machines that they find, and they're going to go play with them, right? This is a lot of what happens out there. Other questions? If you have a machine that's exposed to the internet, not sitting behind a firewall or an app or something, you should assume that it's getting scanned regularly. It's just the way things work. So that brings us to our next point, which is firewalling on Linux. So. Setting up your box is fine and great. It's connected to the internet. We can remote into it now because we have SSH set up. But then there's the issue of, well, I need it connected to the internet because that's how I get services. But at the same time, connecting it to the internet is a big risk. And you kind of want to establish some level of control over, even though I'm connected to the internet, I would like to control exactly what I'm allowing in and out of my server. So that's where the firewall, some firewalling system comes in. Again, there's multiple ways of doing this. Pretty much everything on Linux comes down to IP tables, which is Linux has a built-in packet filter at the kernel level. IP tables is basically the user space tools for configuring that packet filter. So whenever you implement a firewall on Linux, you generally do it via IP tables. Now, you can, if you know IP tables, you can just do IP tables directly and set up your firewall that way. This is how a lot of things, I mean, at like the corporate and lead level, right? This is how you would be doing everything, is just directly in IP tables. That said, IP tables is kind of complicated, so Ubuntu provides on top of it this wrapper essentially called the UFW, or the Uncomplicated Firewall, where it's not doing anything different than IP tables, it's just providing a kind of a set of easier to use configuration scripts that you set them up and then they go and configure IP tables for you. So this is one way of doing it. This is not the only way of doing it. You can edit IP tables directly, and there are other tools that kind of provide the same wrapper level around IP tables. It's installed by default, but it's not enabled by default. So on Ubuntu, the very first thing you have to do is do this pseudo UFW enable kind of concept. And that'll then go ahead and turn it on. By the same nature, you can disable it, and we can check its status. So the goal of a firewall, like I said, is to control what traffic you're allowing into your server and what traffic you're allowing out of your server. And you generally do this so I know my server has certain services that I'm operating, right? I know that I have SSH. I know that I have Apache, so this is just a web server. I know that I'm using Samba, right? So this is for file sharing with Windows and other clients. And we'll talk about these a little bit later. But I essentially know that these are the three main servers, services my server provides. 
each service in, in network land, I don't know how much of a network background people have, but in network land, you kind of filter what application on a computer certain traffic is destined for based upon the concept of a port, where each application has certain ports uh, affiliated with it. So like we said before, on my machine, SSH port 22, Apache is almost always port 80. This is just your standard HTTP port, so most web servers are port 80. It's also port 443, where HTTPS is, uh, uses port 443. I don't actually know the Samba ports off the top of my head, but there's some other ports affiliated with this. So the goal of your firewall is you basically set rules by port. So I'm saying, well, these set of ports are the ones that I'm going to allow incoming traffic on. There's no reason for me to allow incoming traffic on other ports. I might have some unsecure program running on my computer that I don't know about. Maybe someone managed to get physical access machine, install a virus. At least by only allowing traffic on these ports, I'm not going to let them communicate with those other programs until I explicitly allow it. So if we want to look at what that looks like on the server side, we'll go back to here. And we'll run that, um, we'll run that status command. So we'll see when we run this, it kind of shows me the status of what my computer is allowing right now. So it says that I have these, I, I can, if we want to actually see the port numbers, we can make it verbose, spelled correctly. So it's telling me that right now I'm allowing incoming connections from OpenSSH on port 22 using TCP. I'm allowing incoming connections on port 80 and port 443. That's affiliated with the Apache rule that I have set. Uh, again, these are all allowed incoming. If we look up here, my default configuration is to deny all incoming traffic unless it's listed here, but to allow all outgoing traffic. So the reason you don't see any outgoing rules here is because I'm allowing everything to go out. On a production server, you probably wouldn't do that. It's generally a good idea to firewall your outgoing traffic too, so that if someone does manage to get into your machine, at least they can't send data back out. Um, but, like I said, this is not, there's nothing on this server, right? This is my play server. So I allow all outgoing traffic, uh, but I am monitoring what's coming in. I'm specifically allowing these set of, these set of applications, which then it kind of knows what ports are affiliated with them. Um, it lists all the rules twice because it's actually IPv6 aware, that's what this is saying. So it has one set of rules for IPv4, one set of rules for IPv6. Uh, it's kind of just, I mean, you don't need to worry about that too much. If we wanted to add a rule, um, let's go back to my slide for a sec. So all the UFW commands are pretty straightforward. You need root access to manipulate it, obviously. This is kind of how it stays secure, and so any user can't just turn off your firewall. But to allow a rule, there's two ways to do it. I can either allow a port specifically, or the nice thing about UFW is it has kind of a pre-set up list of programs that you might need and what ports they use. So as long as using the default ports, I can just tell it that I want to allow SSH communication, that I want to allow Apache communication. It already knows what ports those are and it files those rules for me. That's why you saw application names next to all those rules. But if I have my own custom written application, I'm testing some piece of network code and it's operating on port 666, right? I can just go ahead and allow that port directly for some period of time. The deny rules work the same way. I can either specifically block, if I, if I know I have a server that I don't want an SSH into, not only should I turn SSH off, I should also make a firewall rule that blocks it all together. So I could block it either by application or by port. Once rules are set, I can delete them by calling the delete command. And if I want to see all the applications that it kind of knows about in its list, I can run the opt command. So if we look at some of these for a second. Um, so let's say we want to allow incoming communication to my server on some new port. We're going to do sudo ufw add, and we'll say port 333. Incept I did something wrong. It's allow, not add. So it added two new rules, one to IPv4, one to IPv6. If I look at the status again now, we can see those new rules I have added shows up down here at the bottom. Whereas before, if you tried to send traffic on this port to my computer, it would have just gotten thrown away. Now it's actually going to get forwarded through that outer filter of the operating system. There's no application on my machine listening on this port, so it's still not going to do anything right now. 
But if I had an application listening, I would now be allowing traffic through. Kind of questions on that? Same deal, if I wanted to remove that, I would just use the delete. And now if we look at the status again, that rule's gone, so I'm back to the configuration I was looking at a minute ago. Like we said, most of these, if we want to see all the applications that are supported, it's actually not a huge list, but it tends to be the ones that you need. So these are, I can use, I mean, you can actually grow this list and you can add your own profiles and stuff, but these are by default all of the things that it knows how to deal with. So when you're setting up a new server and you're in a hurry, you don't generally worry about ports, you just say, well, I know I'm using Apache, I'm going to allow Apache, I know I'm using OpenSSH, so I'm going to allow SSH, and I know I'm using email, that's where these postfix are, so I'm going to allow incoming email. So that's kind of UFW, that's how you set it up. Again, it's a wrap around IP tables, there's other ways of doing this, but this is kind of Ubuntu provides this by default. It's kind of a quick and dirty way to get some of these basic firewall rules up and running uh, on a Linux machine. Questions on this? All right, so. Uh, one last point with UFW. You can get even more complex. So all the rules we were looking at thus far, I want this to go away. Maybe it will here in a sec. All the rules we've been looking at thus far, uh, just open up a port, right? I say anyone who wants to communicate on port 22 can. And that's fine, but that's not always what you want. Say I, I might want to allow people to SSH into my machine, but only from campus, right? Maybe I don't want the rest of the world to be able to do it, I just want campus to be able to do it. So there are ways to set up extended rules where I can basically say, I want to allow all traffic from a certain IP address and subnet mask. So this would be where the combination of these basically defines one IP address and then how many IP addresses close to that that you allow. So I can define a range of IP addresses and then I can define the rule that goes with them. So instead of allowing SSH for the entire world like I have now, I could figure out what IP addresses the University of Colorado machines use. I could say I'm only going to allow SSH connections from these IP addresses. Or the opposite. Maybe all of these script kitties in their dorms are attacking my machine too often, so I might want to block all communication from everything on the University of Colorado campus, right? You can do this in either direction. It's you can you provide whitelisted or blacklisted rules. Um, so it does get more advanced. There's a man page that tells you all about it. That's all I'm going to say about it, unless there are any questions on this. Okay. So the last kind of application we're going to touch on tonight is a program called AppArmor, which kind of covers the... You, you tend to want to cover two sides of security when you're first setting up the server. One side's making sure you're secure from a network perspective, which is what we just looked at with dealing with uh, firewalling. The other side's to make sure you're secure from an application perspective. So as far as application security is concerned, that's what AppArmor deals with. The goal of AppArmor is essentially to ensure that someone can't get you to run some code on your machine that is then going to go and delete all your files, or is then going to go and exploit files that it shouldn't have access to. So AppArmor is actually an implementation of what's called the Linux Security Module, which is a POSIX, it's actually part of a wider POSIX standard for kind of building this kind of application layer security, where what it essentially does is it sandboxes your, your applications. AppArmor watches what every application does, and it has a list of files that the application is allowed to deal with, and a list of files the application is not allowed to deal with, and then you can tell it to, I mean, you can whitelist or blacklist in either direction, like, like in other instances. But essentially what that means is, if someone exploits a buffer, if I have something like SSH running, I know SSH should only be allowed to touch a handful of files. Like, it should be able to read its configuration file, there's a few locked files and logging files it needs to touch, but that's about it. Maybe I'm using some really crappy SSH implementation that has a buffer overflow attack in it. If someone manages to take advantage of that buffer overflow attack and basically gain control of my SSH program to run their own code, they could wreck quite a bit of havoc on my machine. The nice thing about AppArmor is it says, well, I know SSH is only supposed to be touching these parts of the system, that's all I'm going to let it touch. So even if someone manages to use my SSH program to insert their own code or to run their own code, their code's not really going to be able to do anything because AppArmor is going to block its requests to all these other system resources that it has no right to have access to. AppArmor kind of works along the principle of least privilege, which is a concept we see a lot in security, where the principle of least privilege says that you never let something do more than what it absolutely has to do. Because you assume that 
you can't write perfect code. There could be bugs, there could be security flaws, and the more you limit what it can do, if those flaws come to light, the less damage that someone's going to be able to do with it. Right? This is the don't give your programs an Uzi principle in some extent when all they need is a switch plate. So it operates along those principles and essentially enforces the least, the least privilege. It, you define what privileges certain applications have, and this guarantees that it doesn't go past that. It's enabled by default, but it has a couple of different modes. As you can imagine, if this were turned on for every application, you'd never really be able to write code on your machine. Because every time you wrote a new program, this obviously doesn't have a rule for it. It's going to just block all of its traffic, and, or block all of its resource allocations. It's not going to let it do anything. So it has a couple of modes. It has what's called a complaining slash learning mode and an enforce slash confine mode, where by default, any program it doesn't recognize is in this complaining mode, where this will recognize that it doesn't have a rule for it, log it, but it doesn't actually block it. It's when you put it in this enforced mode that it then starts to actually crack down and only let applications do certain things. Again, if you're running a production server where you have it, once you get it set up, uh, you know exactly what needs to be running on there, you generally turn enforcement on by default so that it enforces everything on the machine. If you bring a new program to the machine, it's not going to work until you auto rule for it. That's fine for a production environment. It sucks for a development environment because in a development environment, you don't want to have to come and write app armor rules every time you write some new program that you want to do something, every time you install some new program you want to type, or you want to test. So by default on my system and by default Ubuntu, new programs just get added to this complaining list. So it doesn't actually lock them out. It just monitors them. There are still a few key system, like sudo, some of these kind of key root system programs, sudo, SSH, uh, the stuff that you really care about on security, uh, I do have set to enabled. But when new applications pop up, they go to this list, not this list. So how do we actually look at this? Well, let's pop back over. So if we... So if we want to look at the current status of the system, we can run that status command. So it was sudo app armor status. And I'll pipe it into less. We can actually read it. So if we kind of look at the current status of app armor in my system, uh, it's loaded. And app armor works along the concept of profiles. So you have various profiles, they correspond to essentially each profile corresponds to one program and it lists what that program is or is not allowed to do. So right now app armor is turned on. There's 32 of these profiles loaded by default. Ubuntu provides a really nice big list of these profiles for pretty much every program that's in their repository. So uh, the fact there's only 32 loaded means that that's kind of only the 32 applications I'm really using on my machine. You can also write your own, which we won't really get into today, but if you write your own custom application, you can write an app armor profile to go with it. You can send it to Ubuntu and then they will bundle it with the rest of theirs. So if you're distributing this application, it makes it easy for people to uh, set up app armor for it. Like we said, there's 11 of these in the enforce mode. So these are the programs that actually are forced to only access what it says they're allowed to access in their profile. And as you can see, it's kind of core components. So NT, PD, and SMBD, this is Samba. Uh, this is essentially the file sharing programs on my computer, or part of the file sharing programs. CUPS is the printing system. Chrome is set up to handle this. It's a web browser. It uh, tends to be a common attack vector. It's a good idea to limit it to what it needs to be limited to, and then a few other little items in here. Then there's 21 other profiles that are in this complain mode, meaning that it's monitoring them. Things like ping, things like uh, syslog, all of these others. It's monitoring them, but it's not actually enforcing them. I probably could go and turn on enforcement for a lot of these. I just haven't, because again, this isn't a production server. But uh, there are these two modes. <coughs> these just get logged. There's actually a mode you put it in where if you write a new application, you tell it to start watching it, and it'll actually auto-generate a rule list for you. You say, watch this for the next two hours. You then go and basically run the program through everything you would do in a normal case. It pays attention to everything it touches in the course of doing that, and then it says all of these things are okay for it to do. And then you lock that in. That way if someone later does something that it shouldn't be doing, um, it, it'll block it. Now, you can, of course, both with this and the firewall, it's something, it's an extra thing you have to think about. With my firewall, when I install a new program that needs internet access, now I have to remember to go out a firewall rule for it. Well, AppArmor is kind of the same way. By default, like I said, AppArmor defaults to not caring about things, so it's not as big of a deal as the firewall, which defaults to caring about things. But 
if you're on a production server where this does automatically care about anything, yeah, every time you wrote a new program, you would have to come and specifically put it into watch mode uh, or provide a profile for it. So I'm not going to worry about actually, I mean, if we kind of look at, yeah, there's some more information here, but it's essentially just showing you what is, uh, what's currently enabled, what's not, and it's a really, it's a good thing to do, especially in a production environment. You want some kind of application-based security. There are flaws in the programs running on your machine. This at least limits how much damage can be done if someone exploits one of those flaws. So, like I said, I'm not actually going to run these, but if you go through, you can look at, I mean, this is how you kind of add new rules. You can tell it to add it to the enforce or the complaint list, and you give it the path to the program executable. Again, you can tell it to complain about everything on the system or enforce everything on the system. All of your profiles are stored in this Excedra AppArmor.d folder, and you can create a new profile either by just creating it there, or you can use this GenProof program, which, like I said, that's what kind of monitors it over some period of time and auto-generates a list of everything it's touching. Um, same deal, you can look at the logs. If I wanted to see all those programs that are currently being watched, if I wanted to see what they were actually doing, I could look at these logs here. Any questions on AppArmor, what it does, or kind of the point of application security? How's it differ from SE Linux? I'm sorry? How's it differ from SE Linux? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with it's like Linux. It's a Red Hat version. I don't know. It's, like I said, this is an, AppArmor is an implementation of this 802, et cetera, I mean, of this POSX standard, right? This is my triple E standard that defines how you do this. So I imagine Red Hat probably has their own implementation of it. App Armors also gets used on SUSE Linux at least, so it's, it's not just Ubuntu, but I don't know what other distros use. Any other questions? Having something like this running though tends to be a good idea, be it App Armor or something else. Firewalls are great, but they don't stop everything. And at the end of the day, if someone can corrupt something that's allowed through the firewall, or I mean Apache is even the bigger target interface, right? If someone can get in and crack my Apache somehow, they have open communication on port 80, the firewall is not going to stop them. But App Armor might be able to. Now, Apache's not turned on in App Armor right now, so it wouldn't in this case, but you could set it up to do that. Another question. So, um, does that basically make um, chroot jails obsolete? Is it like a, a less invasive version of that? Or? Yeah, I mean, it, it uses some of those principles. Okay. Um, it tends to be, it's a little bit more of a cleaner, generalized, manageable approach than just doing something like ch rooting your application, right? Uh, but this, uh, yeah, this this allows you to do that without having to read, because ch rooting also imposes a lot of extra limitations that, that makes it hard to do other things. So this is kind of a broader, more generalized way of doing it directly at the kernel level, right? ch root's still a program that has to run and do things. This is built deeper into the kernel, so it's harder to bypass right. uh, or to hack around. Okay. Other questions? Okay. So the last thing we're going to talk about tonight, and I know this is the most riveting topic in the world overall, so thanks for bearing with me, is physical security. Because uh, at the end of the day, you can have this great secure server that checks all of its programs and makes sure they don't do anything they're not supposed to, and that doesn't allow any network communications that it's not. But in case <coughs> no one's ever done it, if you can reboot a Linux machine, you can reset the root password, right? You can go into Grub, you can tell it to load a automatic root session without asking for a password, and you can reset the password on the machine. At the end of the day, if you don't have physical security of your machines, if you can't control who has access to your hardware, your cybersecurity is going to be useless. Um, it means nothing. This is why if you look at big data centers, they pay as much attention to their physical security as they pay to their cybersecurity. Big data centers, things like Amazon and Google, these servers are basically in vaults. They're in vaults, they're often underground, you have to go through multiple doors, it requires ID tags, there are access lists. It's not, a, no one, it's not just anyone that has access to this hardware. This hardware. All of your machines, I mean, these machines don't count because they're lab machines, right? But if you have an office here on campus and you have a machine sitting in it, you should assume that machine's compromised, right? Even if it has a strong password, I can bypass your password by going resetting the root password by rebooting your machine. If I have physical access, I own your box. There's a few exceptions to that, which we'll talk about here in a second, but the main takeaway from this is anytime you're provisioning a server for yourself or for a company, you need to think about physical security. Small company, you can't just go set up a server next to their coffee machine, right? It's gonna, everyone in the office is gonna have access to it. At the very least, you need to like put it in a locked closet or something. 
So what do we have to think about? Well, there's no things we have to think about. Uh, sometimes you end up just locking up the actual physical box, right? But you still want to give someone a keyboard because they need to interact with it. Well, that's fine and dandy, but you have to think about on a lot of Linux machines, hitting control to delete will automatically reboot the machine. Again, if they can reboot the machine and they can have access to your keyboard, they can reset the root password. Uh, so if you're going to give them physical access to your KVM being keyboard, video, or mouse, if you're going to give them physical access to these, you have to make sure you kind of disable this kind of stuff. And there are various ways to do that. Best practice would say you can't even give them access to this, right? If it's a server, you want it locked away somewhere. SSH is the only way to get into it because that's nice, well controlled, and you don't have the physical access problems. Access to the actual box, I mean, there's a number of things you have to worry about. If they can get to the box, they can get to your hard disks. Linux is nice. It has the ability to say only certain users can touch certain files, but that's only enforced if you're actually booted from that file system. If I pop out your hard disk, go and pop it into my other machine, put it into a read-only mode, I can copy every file onto it off. It doesn't matter whether or not you've locked out the user permissions. It's not even mounted in the normal manner. So if you have access to physical hard disks, your data is pretty much compromised. Sniffing, if they have access to the physical box, they can install actual hardware that says, so even if you can control all the software on your computer and you're watching for sniffers and stuff, it doesn't do you any good if they've gone and stuck a physical piece of hardware on the Ethernet jack plugging into your machine. Um, same deal with key logging. If they stick a piece of hardware on your keyboard plugin, they can see everything you're doing. It doesn't matter how secure the system as the, uh, itself is going to be, you're never going to detect it on your firewall because it's not sending that information back to your machine. It probably has its own cell phone built into it. It's dialing back home every night and sending that information out. Rebooting, like I said, comes back to this, both from a, if someone can reboot your machine whenever they want, that's kind of a not great from a quality of service standpoint, but also if they can reboot your machine, there's a lot of things that happen on boot time that give you more access than normal. The standard Linux security provisions don't even come up until you're kind of booted into this higher level mode. So if you have access to the machine across a reboot, you pretty much own it. You can do whatever you want. There are places where before the securities come online that you can get into it and reset the root passwords, turn off things like the firewalls, disable things like app armor, all of this before the machine even boots. And there's a lot of other things we want to talk about. The other place this comes into play is the configuration of mobile versus static resources. So a big server is great, right? You can justify taking a server, putting it in a locked vault somewhere, making sure no one has access to it. But if everyone, you know, every employee in your office has a laptop, I mean, they're not going to lock their, there's a fundamental disconnect here, right? You can't lock a laptop in a bunker because then it wouldn't be much of a laptop anymore. So there is this trade-off you have to think about, and what it really comes down to is, this is why a lot of companies don't let employees really store things on things like laptops. If this is a machine that's traveling, if it's a machine that they could lose, get stolen, etc., as soon as someone has physical access to your machine, they pretty much own it. Uh, and anything on that machine you can assume they can own. It doesn't matter if you have a nice Windows login password. If I have your laptop, I can bypass the Windows login password. It's really not that hard to do. Again, if I have boot time physical access to the machine, I can bypass pretty much anything on it. So, physical security is a major consideration. It's not something you can write off. Again, it tends to get written off. It's like checking your installation media. It's one of those things that when people think about security, they think about things like firewalls. They don't think about things like whether or not they're using a half-decent lock on the closet door where the server's actually sitting. You want a lock that can't be picked, right? There's, there's physical security considerations you have to bring into play here. So best practices in physical security kind of say that wherever your servers are stored has to have some kind of logged and controlled access. It can't just have anyone, you can't just have anyone having access to it. You want controlled access so you know who you're giving access to, and then you want logged access so that if someone who you've given access to does something wrong, you can at least trace it back and figure out who it was. The area needs to be locked and hardened, right? Uh, you, need to, you need to have a lock on the door. This controlled access implies locked, right? But hardened comes along with it too. If you have a single pane glass window that I can kind of pry open with a screwdriver, it doesn't matter that you have a $10,000 card access system on the front of it, I'm gonna go in through the window. So you have to, locked in, hardened environments are starting to come into play. There are standards for this, when, especially in like the cloud world. When you use things like Amazon EC2, Amazon has to have their data center certified by a third-party corporation that basically goes through and doesn't try to hack into them. They go through and try to break into them old school style, right? They're seeing if they can drive a car through the wall, if they can break through. I mean, these are all things that come into play. You can do a smash and grab and get a lot of data, and it's often worth more than a smash and grab you'd do on a bank. So these are things that have to be considered. Um, Obviously, you're a small business, you got one server, the closet's maybe all you can do. But if you're Amazon, yeah, you're using underground, I mean, 
we actually are talking bunkers here. Government's the same way. If you look at some of the big government data centers, they really are underground and a ways underground. The nice thing about being underground is it also gives you control access. You have to take an elevator to get there, and I have to give in specific codes to get on the elevator. So these are all things that come into play. Now, full disk encryption is kind of the one defense to this, uh, and is the one thing that will help you a little bit if you can't guarantee physical security. So on something like my laptop, if I have files I want to store on my laptop, if you're not doing disk encryption, you should assume everything on your laptop is in the public domain because it's really not that hard to lose or have your laptop stolen, and when that happens, they're gonna be able to get to it. Now, if I have files for which I can't afford that, that's where full disk encryption would come in. And at least then, if I encrypt the entire disk on my machine, this is encrypted prior to boot time. It's encrypted, period. So even if they gain physical access to my machine and they can take out that hard disk, they're not gonna be able to read anything on it. So full disk encryption, especially on mobile devices, if you can't guarantee the physical security, and it has to be secure. Not everything has to be secure. I mean, this doesn't have anything but my homework on it, and at the end of the day, if that goes public, who cares? Uh, but if you're in a situation where it has to be secure, but you can't provide physical security because it's a mobile device, full disk encryption is something you at least want to look into, uh, and probably use. If you're not encrypting your disks, and you're not providing physical security, that data's gonna leave. You're, you're not gonna be able to keep it secure. Power redundancy, again, this is kind of more of a quality of service standpoint, but anywhere you're storing server hardware, you should assume that someone can come out and, I mean, even if your server is secure, the power distribution station a block away might not be, right? This is the Italian job effect. If someone, or, or not the, it's not the Italian job, what's the other uh, Vegas movie? Ocean's Eleven. Ocean's Eleven. Ocean Eleven, thank you. The one they made twice. Um, three times. Three times. <laughs> well, okay, but they, they made the original Ocean's Eleven, like back with the Rat Pack in the 1970s, right? And then they remade it, and then they made all the sequels. Yeah. Point being, if someone drives an EMP into my local power distribution station, I don't necessarily want all my electronic locks to go down. That means I need some kind of a generator, some kind of a battery backup. I should assume that I have to be able to remain secure in the event of a long-term power failure. Personnel security, this definitely comes into play. Having locked doors and controlled access doesn't do me any good if the people I'm allowing in are just going to go and sell this or are going to install key loggers. So you have to make sure, I mean, again, the principle of least privilege comes in here. If you have a controlled access data center, you're only going to allow a very small, the, the minimum number of people that need access to it are going to, who are going to have access to it. You're going to be monitoring what happens. You're going to log it. Hopefully, then again, if someone's doing something bad, you can catch them and revoke their access. But at the end of the day, you got to try. I mean, you need to be trusting, of, I mean, I guess that's not the way to say it. You shouldn't trust the people who have access to your machines. You should only give access to your machines to the people you trust. Can this be perfectly determined? No. What's the weakest link in security? It's almost always here. Uh, it's far easier to hack a human than it is to hack most of these machines. Humans are pretty easy to hack, especially if you're a good social engineer. We should do a social engineering session sometimes, but this is something you have to think about. You can't just you can't just hire some IT guy that has a really nice looking LinkedIn page and give him full access to your server, right? It needs to be a little bit more of a vetting process than that. It's not that hard to have a good looking IT page, especially with the kind of money you can make stealing everyone else's data because they give their access to the whole system. Uh, it kind of comes back, this comes back to the servers and the safe type of a concept, um, where you really do physical security. I mean, at the end of the day, it's you're thinking like a bank. You're putting your servers in a location where they are protected from everything that you would protect any other valuable piece of information or valuable item um, in that same manner. So a few things we didn't touch on tonight that just kind of go along with this. So we kind of talked about the basics of setting up these broader security systems. Obviously, then there's all of the services you're actually serving. And each of these services has its own, I mean, when you set up Apache by default, it's not exactly secure. And you boot to it automatically sets up a it's working page on port 80 that just displays, which I mean may or may not be that secure, but it's it's not configuring itself in a no access kind of manner. So anytime you set up a new service, you need to be thinking about going along with setting up that service is securing that service. And it's not a good assumption to assume that the default configuration right after you install one of these things is secure. So if you're gonna take you would if you're going to sit down to set up Apache, you've got to do more than just install it. You have to have enough time to both set it up and actually secure it. They need to go together. We didn't really talk about some of these bigger domain single sign-on type solutions. Uh, this is things like Kerberos, Active Directory, and PAM falls into this too. These are kind of, there are other frameworks for how you handle things like passwords, how you handle things like keys. If you have more than one server and you want to kind of distribute this across them, this kind of gives you the ability to do some of that stuff. 
Um, if you want to learn about any more of this stuff, there's good references online. This is kind of just pointers in that direction. And that's all I have. So, are there any questions? Landon. So, uh, servers, when you're uh, setting those up, you're saying basically that a full disk encryption is only really useful for mobile systems. So, would that just basically be a performance encumbrance, or would that also be a good idea? I mean, it's, so it wouldn't be a bad idea. Sometimes it's more trouble than it's worth. So, the reason every computer in the world and your cell phone doesn't use full disk encryption is because it's kind of hard, right? There's a lot of things that, yeah, this, it doesn't need to be this way, but the thing is, the state of affairs right now is, Enabling full disk encryption tends to break a lot of other things. So you don't tend to do it unless you, I, I mean, it's not something the every man can do, right? You have to kind of know what you're doing to make it work and to make it work well. Um, you could do it on the server. There's certainly nothing wrong with it. But at the end of the day, if your servers are sitting in a bunker a mile underground, I mean, if someone, it, it, it's, if they've already gotten that far, is it really worth even encrypting at that point? I mean, you probably have bigger problems, but it's not a bad idea. It, it's just, it comes into more play on mobile devices because you can't do physical security. So it's all you have. But certainly, do encryption on your servers, it doesn't hurt um, by any stretch of the imagination. It does complicate your life significantly, and that's why a lot of people don't do it. How does it work when you start trying to set up multiple servers together, like build, starting with the server farm? Um, you have like one main central one? Well, so a lot of that gets back into some of this stuff. So Kerberos and Active Directory are how you deal with a lot of that. So Active Directory is kind of the Windows concept where you have a domain, right? Where you have this one server who's kind of in charge of providing administration. It provides like a centralized user database, a centralized set of passwords, centralized file stores. And it, I mean, Microsoft has their way of doing it. It's called Active Directory, but that's how it's done in large organizations. Kerberos is kind of a similar, it's an open standard that's somewhat similar. It allows you to say, when you log into this machine, instead of looking at the local passwords file on the local user list, I'm going to farm that request out to this server. That server is then going to authenticate the user for me and just tell me whether or not that's an authenticated user. So things like Kerberos get used a lot in large organizations. CU probably uses a little bit of both of these. Some uh, You can make them work together in various ways. but. When you're getting into the, I have more than one server, obviously you don't want to have to maintain a user database on every server you have. Or it's not even just servers, it might be servers on all your user machines, right? So all of these machines in here, so these machines in here are a little bit different because they actually load a local image up too. But it's not like they, all of these gone around and configured each one with everyone's username and password, right? There's a wider, and actually it's probably is Kerberos that's been used for this, but like when you set up your password on that internet website, and set it up, you have your UTLN for the entire campus, it's getting set up through some kind of system like this, where there's a centralized database, and instead of requests being handled locally, they then get sent to that database and basically get handed back whether or not it's succeeded. So there's a bunch of different ways to do it. This is kind of the main ways. It's one of these two things, depending upon whether you're on Microsoft or non-Microsoft land, uh, tend to be the tools of choice. Anything else? Going once. So I'll stick these slides online and send out, well, I mean, they're online already, they're Google Doc, but I'll send out a link to them to the e-list. Um, by all means, I'll put them in the public domain. Feel free to reuse them or play with them or do what have you. If you are on the hacking team, why don't you stick around for five minutes or so just so we can all touch base afterwards. If not, thank you for coming. We'll do it again in two weeks. We're also always looking for speakers. Uh, I'm not exciting enough to do this every week. So if anyone else has a topic they'd like to talk about, you don't have to be an expert on it. If you think you can stand up here for an hour and talk about something that interests you, we'd love to have you. Uh, so if you're interested in speaking at the next one, I don't think we have a topic, stick around for a few minutes now, let me know. I'll also send out an email request to that effect. Um, but if you're on the hacking team, stick around too. Otherwise, thank you for coming and have a good night.